Okay, good evening to our Thursday evening seminar. And it is uh, the construction roundup this, this month. Um, and we are joined by Richard Silver, senior partner. We are joined by Mohammed Huck, who is consultant barrister, adjudicator and quantum expert. And Mr. John Sharp, joining us from Scotland, who is consultant solicitor and uh, also compliance and insurance expert. So gentlemen, welcome to this evening's seminar. Evening. Thank you. For Evening, time. Julie. Good evening, Julie. Um, you've all been uh, looking at various hot topics over the last couple of weeks. Um, Richard, I'm going to start with you. The inquiry on Grenfell is still affecting the marketplace. What's your update on this? Yes, um, very much so. Uh, the reality is, is um, I have found myself getting various instructions in the last three to four weeks to do with combustible materials in external walls, both in relation, or in relation to uh, subcontractors and contractors with actions being taken against them and acting on behalf of employers who are considering taking action. Um, it seems to me that um, all parties are now becoming aware of the potential problem um, and are being forced to take action in one way or another. Um, clearly, with the construction of new works, um, the government's um, building regulations amendment, which came into force uh, in December 2018, the 21st, um, prohibits the use of combustible materials anywhere in external walls of high buildings over 18 metres high. Um, but it not only applies to new buildings, but would also apply to buildings where there are refurbishment works which affect the external walls or where the building previously was not used for residential, but is now being altered for use of residential. Um, so that's having a big effect. But the government also published an advice note back in January 2020 asking or requiring all builders or, or building owners of multi-storey and multi-occupied resident, residential buildings to investigate the risk of their buildings with regards to potential problems with uh, cladding, irrespective of their height. The result is, is that nearly all building owners, and I am one, um, are looking at their existing buildings and looking at what is the risk and whether the external cladding or otherwise is potentially combustible. And if it is, what action is gonna be taken? Now, it will come as no surprise that if you're gonna be doing some form of action, it's gonna be very expensive and landlords don't wanna spend their money. So what they're doing is looking to see whether or not they have any potential action against either the consultants who probably were involved with the design originally and or contractors and or subcontractors. Um, but we should remember that these buildings can be quite old um, and a party can in theory still take legal action up to 15 years after practical completion. But the big issue is um, limitation periods. This is really where the key is. Um, if a contract is executed underhand, um, a party will have six years in which to take action. And that six years runs from, in general, the date of PC when you're looking to take an action against a contractor. Um, if it's going after an architect, it's likely to be six years from the date they've issued the final certificate. So it could be later. If it's under seal, you've got 20, 12 years. And potentially under the Late De Latent Defects Act, you've got a long stop of 15 years, but you've got three years from the date you knew of the defect, that you knew it was sufficiently serious to warrant taking action, and you knew who was responsible. But the key point is, is we've got a timeline, we've got a limit in which we can take the action. And if we don't commence proceedings in that time, the other party has a defense that you are out of time. So what is happening is people are commencing actions, so they are within time. But the problem is, is they don't know whether there's any defects and they don't know who really is responsible. So I'm aware of one employer, for example, 
who's issued five writs against five different organisations because they don't really know who's responsible. So if in doubt, and I think it's very wise, sue everybody. And that's what's happening. They're suing everybody. And I've got, by way of an example, a subcontractor who's being sued for defects alleged in the cutting for works they haven't carried out. It was nothing to do with them. Um, but the, the contractor's been sued. So what the contractor is simply do is to sue all of these subcontractors. But without copies of the subcontracts or anything else, they're a bit in the blind. So all they're doing is suing everybody. Um, so that's really what I'm seeing is a lot of actions being commenced against lots of different organisations. And then what is happening is the claimant is looking for some form of stay to stop the clock ticking to then actually find out whether they've got a claim. And quite obviously, the defendant is less than happy than agreeing to this. I think the other thing that I did find not unsurprising is that there are now some organisations who are considering adjudication rather than litigation in seeking to recover such monies, um, simply because adjudication is so much quicker and cheaper than litigation. It's my view that a lot of these cutting cases, you know, will take years. And at the problem, of, the main problem at the moment is a distinct uncertainty as to what the contractor's obligation was at the time they carried out the works. And for that matter, the consultants as well. Because as you will have seen in the news, one of the major problems was that the reg regulations that were in place at the time were less than good. Um, and therefore, lots of people could have complied with the regulations at the time but that they do not comply with what are the current regulations. And the issue, therefore, that will be before the courts is, is can the government effectively, retrospectively, put a greater obligation on the consultants and the contractors than was known at the time? So if I give you a very simple example, let's just say that at the time it was said that for external walls you could do a half brick, no more. And everybody used half brick. Well, the government is now saying, well, that isn't good enough and you now need to do a one brick wall. But at the time, no one knew that. Yet, the government is effectively saying that hard luck, we're retrospectively changing what was the obligation and you are now responsible. Now, no one knows whether that's actually what the courts will find when this matter goes before them. Um, there is a case going at the moment, um, and it will give us some guidance, ultimately, when judgment is passed down. Um, but at the moment, there is distinct uncertainty. So in summary to your question, I'm very, very busy dealing with cladding claims, and I cannot believe I'm the only one. Um, and it is being passed all the way down the construction line, starting up with the employer who's taking actions against the contractor, the consultants, and any subcontractors, subcontractors under collateral warranties. There's actions against the suppliers and further down. Um, and I can only see it increasing over time. Okay, and I'm sure that we get some results back from that case, you'll, uh, you'll be on with an update for us on that. Yes, I will, but I've got a feeling it's got some time to run yet. Uh, we're not going to get any certainty for some while. I think the other big issue is the government and whether they give, you know, they've provided at the moment potential funding to um, leaseholders whose buildings are over 18 storeys to have the works carried out. Because, you know, let's be perfectly honest, the people who are really suffering are... Um, the people in these buildings. Um, because at the moment, um, the House of Lords, every time the bill gets passed to them, is passing it, uh, is rejecting it, because they're not happy that within the bill, only certain people are given assistance. Those that are tenants or, or, or leaseholders in buildings under 18 storeys are not being given any grants or assistance at all. There is potentially some funding loans and, and the like but you know that's not going to really help people and there are a lot of leaseholders at the moment who have bought properties 
that they can neither get mortgages or nor can they sell. So it's going to be a big, big problem. And I think it's got some time to run yet. That sounds like that's going to get quite messy. Um, John, bearing in mind what Richard's just been talking about, um, and along with the uh, results from the recent test case run by the FCA uh, in reference to business interruption claims, um, how is the professional indemnity marketplace at the moment? Um, uh, exceptionally difficult. Um, it was difficult before. It was difficult, really. It started in 2018. We're in what's called a hard market, a hard insurance market which I have not seen since 2002. And the only reason there was a short blip in terms of rates going up in 2002 was the tragic events of 9-11 and the worst floods in Europe that anyone had known in living memory. But that didn't last very long. Within 18 months, two years, it had gone back. There was plenty of capacity in the market and rates were comparatively low and insurers were competing against each other for the business. And therefore, when they compete, you get better cover. They expand the cover, the risks they're going to cover, etc. But in 2018, Lloyd's had a good look at the um, syndicates operating under its umbrella and decided that realistically they were writing these risks at a premium that was never going to cover losses of any substance. Um, and therefore, they would have to look to Lloyd's central funds. And obviously, Lloyd's central funds don't want to pay. So the instruction was pretty firmly given that you either write it at a commercial rate, so one that's going to be profitable and can cover claims. You just work on the analysis that every pound of premium you pay, 33p goes to run the business, 33p goes to as a claims reserve, and 33p goes to actually pay claims, um, the 33 pounds claims reserve, 33 pence claims reserve gets invested in as a return. If of course there's a market to invest in, which there isn't at the moment. So lawyers were very worried that the central funds would be called upon. That resulted in a number of underwriters withdrawing and saying, right, we're not writing this type of business anymore, in particular professional Um on top of that, we had a small issue with an aircraft called the 737 MAX, which didn't work, and Boeing had very large coverage and claimed, and having paid its premiums for many, many years without issue, has been paid out, or a good part of it anyway. So that was a market-wide loss. On top of that, certainly in the construction industry, the insurance market's been watching very closely the Grenfell decisions. It's very, very, very about there being a finding of some sort of conspiracy between um, the builders, the local authority, government, et cetera. Don't quite know what that decision's going to be, but all that's done is absolutely frighten them to death. And they are therefore reserving more and more um, premium to pay the potential claims. On top of that, they really have now said enough. They are not going to insure you for cladding work. They will not insure you for external wall combustible material. They don't want anything whatsoever to do with fire risks. So my son, this is a very practical example, even though this was a traditional uh, breeze block and uh, brick construction, uh, on external walls and the building wasn't over 18 metres high, the, the surveyor still required a, a um, fire certificate before he would sign off because his professional indemnity policy will not cover him. So my strong advice to everybody um, is to now to read again your policy work because what you thought you might have been covered for three years ago, you're extremely like, unlikely to be covered for now. So you really need to read that wording to make sure that the work that you're doing at the moment is covered by your insurance policy. Because I have a horrible feeling it won't be. The wordings have also narrowed. Your premiums, as everyone will know, have increased dramatically. 
And I think it's going to be very difficult to find coverage for doing cladding work. There is apparently one syndicate at the moment that is writing that sort of work, but under very tight conditions, only if you can show and demonstrate that this cladding is of the highest quality, does not cause fires, etc. Is this likely to continue for some period of time? Well, as Richard said, he thinks it's going to continue for some period of time because everyone is now claiming on their professional indemnity policies in relation to the cladding that they installed years and years ago. And insurers too are trying to get out of this. So you're faced with two battles. You're faced with, well, do I have coverage? And secondly, is the insurer going to cooperate and actually pay? Because they're trying to find every excuse not to. And that's again, as Richard said, that's if you can find the right contract to sue on, because each contract will be linked to an insurance policy. So it's going to be extremely difficult. And I cannot see the professional indemnity market insurance, or indeed the insurance market improving for at least the next four to five years. So we're in a hard market for a long time. That means insurers narrow cover, they increase premiums, and they also fight every claim that you put before them. And yes, Julie, as you mentioned earlier, the business interruption decision, it's had some effect, but not as much as you would think, because again, insurers are still looking at that 720 page judgment and finding every last angle to avoid paying those as well. Um, I also agree with Richard that this is going to be a long fight on some of them because insurers will be funding the bill and they will find it bizarrely probably cheaper to pay lawyers than it is to actually pay the claims. And I agree again with Richard that puts some people in a very, very unfortunate position. And I think that's right. We, we've mentioned the fact that there are a lot of instructions for actions against contractors and architects. The other growth area is actions against insurers, because yeah. basically the insurers companies are, to be perfectly honest, they're not even considering whether they've got a liability. What they're doing is saying, you've made a claim, we will reject it. Doesn't matter. Everything. And I think they're working on a very simple theory that if we reject every claim 25 percent of them may go away and Absolutely. therefore even yeah. if we spend more monies on <clears throat> lawyers in fighting them we will still be better off Absolutely. Um, i think john you know is probably the best person to mention it it is look at your policy make sure you don't do something that waives your entitlement um, and just because the insurer has said no doesn't mean they're right. Um, no. We've seen a number of situations where insurers are rejecting claims for no good reason at all, just in the vain hope that the insured will go away. Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> That's absolutely right. So I would always say, always worth taking a bit of advice to see where you can go. The financial ombudsman service is always good. It's not necessarily quick, but an adjudication is also available to, but I just, at the moment, insurers are taking a very hard line approach to everything, having been stung in effect from various different quarters. Gone are the days when they will just simply pay the claim. They won't be doing that. I, I think that's a good point you've mentioned there, John, about adjudication. I've had a case not that long ago um, where a contractor um, was taking an action against an architect for negligence, breach of contract, uh, and rather than going through the standard process of litigation, chose to go through adjudication. Now, I think the insurance was quite clear that they, albeit they said they had no liability, recognised that they did. And being faced with an adjudication and it being perceived to be potentially rough justice, and because it was going to be fairly quick, um, they looked at their situation and actually chose to seek to settle before an adjudication decision was reached, uh, because it was good commercial sense. The risk was simply too great for them. 
and yeah. our client was able to get monies quickly and effectively rather than going through the litigation, which we all know, you know, can take five, six years. Oh, absolutely. Um, especially in construction disputes. But I'm just simply wanting to point out to everyone, and I think this is probably the most important point. What you think you were covered for two or three years ago, you will probably not be covered for now. And I'm seeing a number of clients coming to me now saying, well, uh, I thought I was covered for it. Well, you aren't. You really do more than ever need to read your policy wording because it will have changed dramatically from that that you had three years ago to the one that you have now. Anyway, that's all I was going to say, Julian. Okay, and thank you for, yet again, injecting the words, read your policy wording into a... My seminar. favourite line. <laughs> we should play bingo with that one. Okay, um, over now to Mohammed. Now, uh, we mentioned dispute resolution earlier, and it's a current hot topic, as always. You're running a, a, a new seminar series on conflict avoidance and early intervention. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Right, thanks, Julie. And uh, I would start with an interesting uh, comment that when I was planning uh, uh, as to what I'm going to say today, I didn't know that um, I'll be supplementing both Richard and John because I don't need to establish now anymore that we are in a scenario where disputes will be more than less in post-pandemic and post-Brexit. We have nothing but, we're gonna have nothing but disputes all around us. And we have the threat of uh, uh, limitations and the threat that um, the insurers may not pay and so on and so forth. So we won't have much time uh, to think and start uh, a formal um, a dispute resolution process. Now, what I'm going to emphasize tonight is just take a step back because, I mean, Richard has already mentioned that and John as well, that what are the problems? Because if you want to win a dispute or resolve a dispute, there is, there is something called managing it as well. And by, by managing it, I mean that you, you got to be sure that there is a dispute, you have a claim, and you got to be sure that that's rooted to a document like John was mentioning about the policy. My point was about the contract. Because nine, and, and Richard already mentioned that, that at the, I mean, post event, and we are reaching towards limitation, and all of a sudden we understand that we need to uh, make a claim and we don't find the contract. Where is it? You know, what was the contract? So the first thing would be to do this avoidance is to know your contract. And imagine we have not been going to offices. The offices have been closed down and then um, uh, the documents have been shifted somewhere else. Uh, although we say we live in a cloud-based society, but still, contracts are signed and, and, and files are created and printed out. And it may so happen that we go back to office and we don't know where the contract is, what the specs were, what the time limit in detail was, where there are variation issued or not. So before even we go to uh, start a, a dispute a resolution process, we need to think that can we avoid in the sense or uh, decrease or reduce the number of issues? And we can only do so, just I'm pick, I've just picked up on this, that can we just reduce the number of issues we have? And if we want to do that, we need to know what the contract was. And you might be very surprised to find out your time clauses, which you have dealt with for years, 
are not actually giving you a solution for this pandemic situation. Or the supply chain post Brexit may pose a different type of challenge where the delay is going to be inevitable. Now, how would you handle that? And you, you look back, you go back to your JCT, ANEC, and you find, oh, hang on a minute, it doesn't address this. So first of all, we need to establish the contract. And the second one, of course, once we know more or less what it is, and I tell you that you cannot in-house establish that so easily because if you go to your um, uh, professionals, they might assist greatly because they will be able to tell you from maybe from lost documents, but going through forensically and post-contract behavior that what was a, your the extent of your obligation. Now, once you have established it, there's an issue of partnering as well, meaning that communicating with the other sides where you are claiming money from, where, did, where do they stand? And obviously they have a very important role of the insurance as well, how, how they're gonna react. These to be assessed very objectively, not, to, uh, not for the purposes of just for the sake of uh, uh, starting a case or a speed resolution process, but to really know whether you, you stand a chance or not. Because even without uh, going into uh, up to the end of a process, you might spend so much, even in an adjudication, and only find that you cannot recover it. So that's, that's another thing you have to think of, that please define your claim, define your parties, and then try to collaborate, try to communicate try to discuss if there is something you can bring on table, and we all know that it's a difficult period, can we find a solution? But the problem is, unless the insurance pays or there is a budget from where the pair can pay, you cannot just by, by chatting, you cannot come to a, a, a solution. The, the employer or the contractor may be very sympathetic to you, and maybe, maybe a very nice person behaving well, but if he doesn't have the money, where shall he pay, pay it from? Now, in that situation, can we do something? And that has made it so such a big hot topic that can we do something together at any level, wherever we have a relationship to, to, to have, a, have a, another collateral contract or an agreement to list the issues we are having and the difficulties we are having and to resolve it proactively and jointly. This is of course to, to an extent an utopia, but institutions have been thinking about it, that let's give it a try. And you'll be surprised that we have just partnered with RICS, they have come to us to hold this concept and kind of market it to the, or, or dish it out to the wider market they have in their hand a scheme, which they've applied to um, London Underground and TFL, where um, uh, we, we just give, let me give you one example that we frequently have ground condition disputes. And we always in bigger contracts and smaller contracts, what we do, the employers say, okay, this is the report, a subsurface report, done by a very reputable contract um, uh, consultant, but you cannot rely on that. You cannot rely on that. You have to take your own, uh, rely on your own judgment, whether to take the risk on board or not. And you, and, and, the, and the contractors have no other choice but to, but to sign on to that. But very recently in, an, in, in, an, in a uh, London Underground contract, some ex experts have been appointed to neutrally value it because the parties have agreed and share the risk post-contract. Forget about what happened three years ago, how the things were moving, but we are in a very, very difficult situation. And we got to, come, got to accept this reality. And if we acknowledge that, okay, if I take a 
very hard line that let you be biased and go away, I don't mind, you'll have the, you'll not get the project done. So whether that's possible and the claim is, I don't know, the claim is RICS is claiming and we'll have our, have our uh, sessions, four sessions each one month, once every month. Um, they're claiming that it's working, it's working. And what I would say, even I, I'm a adjudication practitioner uh, mainly, that, well, you, you can, anyway, everyone can take something from it, that let's do a good management of our claim and try to understand where we are and whether our claims are supported by uh, extant proof and right kind of documentation and only then take the action and just do not hurry, you know. And that's all I, uh, from me this evening you know, about this topic. Thanks, Bo. I've got a couple of things just to add to that. Um, agree everything with what you say, but I think there's just two points I would like to add. I think number one is, is that you must know who you've got a dispute with. And that seems a strange statement to make. But the point is, is that quite often, it's not the person you think you've got a dispute with. So in the most simple of contracts, let's just say there's an employer and the contractor. And the contractor thinks they're entitled to an extension of time, loss and expense, variations, and the employer keeps not paying. You would think that the dispute must be between the contractor and the employer. However, it may not be. It may be with the consultants because the consultants are wrongfully telling the employer that the contractor's got no entitlement. Now, the employer's saying, well, I'm paying for these consultants to give me advice. Why wouldn't I believe them? So your dispute isn't really with the employer. It is with the consultants. And therefore, your strategy in dealing with the dispute should be aimed at the consultants, not the employer. Now, I don't mean take an action against the consultants, but think how you're going to change the position of the consultants, how you're going to put the consultants in a position where they've got to admit you're right. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. And um, the second thing is, is that we have a tendency, I would say nine out of 10 times, that the person who goes to adjudication is seeking money. And I think there is two things that people should consider. Number one is don't consider money, but consider matters of principle, whether there is a variation, whether it is an extension of time event, rather than the actual detailed item. But more importantly, I believe in a number of cases, the question should be is, you're not entitled to any money. In other words, the person who should be going to adjudication should be the person who is trying to avoid liability. Because, and again, particularly with my cladding ones, we have a situation where there is a party who knows, who doesn't really know who's responsible. And at the moment, they've taken an action against my client and are proceeding with it. And this could go on for some considerable time and my client could be put to considerable cost. What you can do is, is force the other party to become aware that in fact they may not have any entitlement. And that's by going to adjudication on a matter of principle. For example, this element of works was not within our scope. Or that the scope of works within the contract says this and that's what we've complied with. So quite often, Parties know that they've got a potential dispute commencing against them and they're simply waiting for them. And what they're doing is giving the other side more time to put their case together. What you often consider is, is to bring the matter to an end very promptly by commencing an action against them first. Um, and I've done that a number of occasions recently um, with considerable success. Um, and it is something that clients find quite strange. But we're going to adjudication against them. I came to speak to you to try and defend it. And you're advising no attack. Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing, is look at what is founding this claim. If you can knock those foundations away, everything goes away. And that can be a very valuable way of effectively dispute avoidance. You are avoiding what could be a very big dispute by dealing with a very small dispute at the outset. 
Exactly, Richard. I mean, that's what I was trying to refer to, that uh, reducing the uh, issues by prioritizing uh, them and uh, first breaking them into smaller sects and then um, um, and setting it up in a logic chain that unless these are right, we'll never get our money. So let's just, let's just do that first. And as you just mentioned very rightly about the party, and that's of course with my um, um, knowing your contract thing and what other characters other than the party immediate, as you said, the employer and the contractor may also be. And that also takes us to the collaborative approach and establishing communication um, and, and trying to establish in front of them um, uh, uh, comprehensively and reasonable attempts to be made uh, to the professionals why we are right, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that necessarily doesn't always mean that we'll not go to adjudication, but uh, we might uh, organize it in a way that will save eventually time and money. I, I suppose I'd only got just one point to add from a, a pure litigation point of view. Now, I re was reminded of this when I did the project security talk earlier this week. Um, one of the things the construction industry is very bad at, and I think, I hope that both you would agree, is actually keeping proper records and signing contracts and amending them properly so that you will have somewhere a suite of documents that you can refer to in relation to um, any particular contract that you've signed. Sadly, when I ask for those documentations on occasions, uh, I don't really get very much at all. So I think it's probably worth stressing that at the contractual stage, it's probably worth signing the documents, making sure they're accurate, that the right of um, uh, drawings and everything else are attached to them, because it will make your life easier rather than potentially the three of us having to speculate as to what could have been agreed, might have been agreed, I don't know, could have been possibly. So I would urge everyone, please, to, to look and sign their contractual documentation. It's important. Sorry, John, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think contractual oh, are very poor. That's fine. I really sure. don't. I, I don't think they're that good. I think they are shocking. Very oh. poor, even <laughs> strong enough. <laughs> I have never seen people enter into agreements with such big values on little agreements or with a shake of a hand. They are terrible. Yes, but I would go with. beyond that. Not only are they terrible in getting the contract documents signed, they are terrible in putting the documents together to start with. Now, I've got two very good friends. I've got a brother, well, not a friend, my brother-in-law, um, who's done a number of works with his house. And he's always sort of said, well, I was speaking with the builder and, you know, do I really need a contract, Richard? Yes. yes you, do. <laughs> you know, all these builders, I've got so, so many disputes and I'm sure Mo will say exactly the same, where the parties uh, are two parties and they were at one time or another the best of friends. And we met in the pub and we shook hands on this deal and I thought they would be providing a white door and the other one swears it was a red door. And, you know, they fall out time and time again. So two bits of advice. Number one, yes, get the contract signed. But more importantly, get the contract to reflect what you actually want. Do not rely upon, oh, they're a good builder, they're good friends, this, that and the other. Because it will not work. I so know. Sorry, <clears throat> they're not good. They're I'm good. glad I'm glad you agreed with me, Richard. I preached that yesterday, and I didn't think... I obviously, from now on, will put it higher and just say you're wholly incompetent at getting anything signed and put together properly. Well, so, uh, you know, I, I imagine in the audience, I wonder how many of the people are working on projects under a letter of intent or an unsigned contract. Yeah. And I reckon that if I was not mistaken, I would say it would be over 50%. Yeah, I would say more. And that if is, it goes to subcontracting yeah. level, it's more. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody. And you Just know, like you're come thinking on site, come on site, start it. Come on site, start it. We'll give you the document. Yeah. So, so on a person, a, a completely personal level, please do not stop that. Continue to do that form, and do take our numbers to call us.
<laughs> Thank you for that, Richard. Um, right, so just to uh, round up, if anyone has any questions for any of our panellists, please, please feel free to put them in either the chat box or the Q&A tool now. Please answer them. Equally, if you are having a problem that you don't particularly want to raise an open forum, um, you can get hold of all of the guys and they're at silverllp.com addresses. Richard Silver, John Sharp and Mohammed Hack at silverllp.com. Indeed, the gentlemen are all online again in the month of May. We have Richard with his Construction Essential series. He's talking about loss, expense and damages. Um, we also have John, who's running the Professional Indemnity Insurance and uh, Design Liability Post Grenfell. That's the 19th of May, 8am. Uh, and uh, Mohammed is uh, on a couple of times. He has his adjudication matters, do's and don'ts. He also has the new seminar series he referenced earlier. The first of which is on the 20, Tuesday, the 25th of May at 6pm. And it's very much setting the scene about what conflict avoidance and early intervention is. Um, what that all means and that as he quite rightly said earlier will be followed by um, once a month events in June, July and uh, the last one will be in September. So for any of these if you'd like to book a place to log in then please email us on seminars at silverllp.com and I know we'd be delighted to see you online. So gentlemen it looks like you've uh, scared everyone into running off and uh, finding which drawer their contracts are currently locked in uh, <laughs> and reading their insurance policies. So well done for causing some sleepless nights there, gentlemen. Um, but sound advice nevertheless, thank you very much to all of you for your time. Thank you to everyone for logging in to listen to our panel this evening. And as I say, next month, it'll be the property team doing their roundup uh, and the construction team will be back again in July. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, gentlemen, and we will wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Julie.